Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for another CIFA webinar. Today's webinar is the Million Hearts Cardiac Rehabilitation Collaborative. We have two speakers for today, Haley Stoppel and Damaro Lindsay. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Stoppel will be presenting on the uh, Million Hearts Initiative. She is currently a public health analyst uh, on the Million, Heart, Million Hearts team at the CDC. And we also have uh, Mr. Lindsay, a senior exercise physiologist from Emory Healthcare, who will uh, tell us about some best practices for uh, cardiac rehab referrals, enrollment, participation, and adherence. Uh, I want to remind everyone um, that we will be sending out the uh, presentation and CEUs in a day or two after this recording. Uh, and also at the end of this recording, uh, we'll have a few minutes to answer any questions that you might have. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our two uh, presenters. Thank you, Tim. This is Haley Stolp. Um, I'm happy to be speaking to you uh, from Million Hearts here at the CDC. I am a contractor with IHRC Incorporated and the opinions expressed in today's presentation are those of my own and do not necessarily reflect that of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services or the CDC. Thanks, Tim. This is Demario Lindsay. I'm representing Emory Healthcare. I am a senior exercise physiologist over the Cardiac Re uh, Rehabilitation Program. Happy to be here with Haley and Tim. Thanks for having me. As an overview for my presentation today, I'll talk about the burden of cardiovascular disease in the United States, um, provide an overview of Million Hearts 2022, we are a national initiative that's uh, tackling cardiac rehab, give an overview of the cardiac rehab collaborative efforts, and specifically speaking to the cardiac rehab change package that's currently out to increase use of cardiac rehab across the country, and then showcase a few partnership opportunities for exercise physiologists and other stakeholders. So first, uh, there's about 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes every year, about 800,000 deaths per year due to cardiovascular disease, making uh, heart disease the number one cause of death in the United States, costing hundreds of billions of dollars per year, and cardiovascular disease is also the greatest contributor to racial disparities in life expectancy, attributing for about one in four years of fewer life expectancy years um, in African Americans compared to the white Caucasian. Looking at a circulation article from 2017, this is, shows the steady decline in heart disease and stroke deaths um, over the years. We see a steady decline until uh, most recently we see that flattening off. Um, so the slowing of the rate of mortality is concerning. Uh, we largely attribute this to the increase in diabetes, obesity, and physical inactivity. And this demonstrates the efforts that Million Hearts has and the work of all of our stakeholders and partners to reverse this trend and ensure that that decline is continuously going down. Um, unfortunately, we actually see a rise in cardiovascular disease when we look at certain age cohorts. So this is data from 2010 to 2015, ages 35 to 64 year old. And in red is the increase in the mortality rate in this age group um, with the darker red indicating a 10 or more percent change in cardiovascular disease mortality. Um, again, this shows our efforts to work and specifically targeting this age group um, with the rise in mortality in our country. So Million Hearts 2022 is a national initiative co-led by us here at the CDC and our colleagues in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The initiative as a whole focuses and aligns efforts across a small set of evidence-based um, both public health and clinical strategies. And if we look at the framework, we focus on keeping people healthy in the community, optimizing care in the clinical setting, and improving outcomes for priority populations. And Million Hearts 2022 is wholly implemented through a partnership um, across the federal, state, and local agencies, and also private organizations. There's substantial modeling data that shows where a million hearts can make the greatest impact towards the aim of preventing a million heart attacks and strokes in five years. Um, here we see blood pressure control and cholesterol management are the two uh, primary risk factors that we can address to prevent that million. And I add cardiac rehab as being a key component of this effort as well. 
This is the breakdown of Million Hearts 2022. Um, in the Keeping People Healthy focus areas, we specifically are looking to reduce sodium intake, decrease tobacco use, and decrease physical inactivity. And we've set the target of a 20% reduction across these three strategies. In optimizing care, we focus on improving ABCs. This is the aspirin when appropriate, blood pressure control, smoking, um, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. Uh, we also added an increased use of cardiac rehab, which is the focus of today's presentation. Um, we set a 70% target for increasing use of cardiac rehab in our clinical settings. We also focus on engaging patients in heart-healthy behaviors. This includes strategies such as self-measured blood pressure monitoring, um, medication adherence approaches, and um, also cardiac rehab fits well within this as well. Finally, within our improving outcomes for priority populations, we focus on four groups for which we've seen a disparate burden of cardiovascular disease and an opportunity to address it. It includes Blacks, African Americans with hypertension, again, those between the ages of 35 and 64 year olds, as per the data I just showed, people who've had a heart attack or stroke, and people with mental illness or substance use disorders who use tobacco. And again, today we'll be speaking to the increased use of cardiac rehab and improving outcomes for people who've had a heart attack to prevent secondary events. So many of you are familiar with what cardiac rehab entails. Um, nationwide, unfortunately, we've only had about 10 to 34 percent of eligible people in the United States are currently participating in cardiac rehab. Um, so we have tremendous progress to be made. If we look specifically at referral, we see the breakdown of referral to cardiac rehab um, by the qualifier. So about 80% of those with a heart attack are referred, 60% of those with undergo angioplasty, and 10% unfortunately with heart failure. So more efforts to be underway to increase referral of patients with qualifying heart failure. Um, and this does indicate referral. However, a successful referral, studies have shown, um, is coordinated with the strength of the physician's endorsement and greatly influence the patient's enrollment in cardiac rehab. That's really the eye-to-eye -eye conversation with a clinician in the inpatient setting, largely. Referral also varies predominantly by hospitals. So this is a, a graph from a paper released in the JAC in 2015, and it shows 60% overall average referral rate. Um, and we see that the range varies very much by the hospital. So some hospitals are referring 0% of their patients and some are referring 100% of their patients. We'll hear from where Emory sits in this and the work that they've been doing to increase the referral rate. Um, but it really demonstrates the need for hospital engagement in the world of cardiac rehab referrals. Many of you are familiar with the barriers to cardiac rehab use. There's systematic levels, um, lack of awareness due to the uh, value of cardiac rehab. Uh, no clear, consistent messaging to patients and their family members. I really want to emphasize having the family members in the room when they have that conversation with the physician, um, and hopefully a cardiac rehab liaison to facilitate that exchange as well. Um, the program not being implemented into the cardiovascular services provided in the hospital setting or the primary care setting for those that have a uh, diagnostic uh, qualifier like heart failure or stable angina. Eligible patients not systematically identified in the, the EHRs not automatic electronic referral process, um, and programs not available in the service area. Unfortunately, there are regions in our country for which cardiac rehab programs are not easily accessible. There's also a number of patient level barriers, um, logistics of getting to a, a program um, due to transportation, scheduling, cost sharing, so the co-payments for, co for cardiac rehab sessions, um, and competing responsibilities, again, getting to a program outside of work and childcare responsibilities. Um, as well as cultural language issues. This is a document that was released in 2017, um, and it indicates the work of the Cardiac Rehab Collaborative. collaborative. Um, this is where Million Hearts came together with subject matter experts to identify the key strategies we can implement to increase use of cardiac rehab. Um, and we found increasing participation from 20 to 70% would save an estimated 25,000 lives and would prevent 180,000 hospitalizations every year in the United States. This really sets the platform for our work in increasing use of cardiac rehab. Um, over the years, so this is a 2017 paper we originally met in 2015 with subject matter experts. Um, and today, here we are in 2019, we have over 300 cardiac rehab professionals, referring clinicians, quality improvement specialists, public health professionals and stakeholders um, from about 120 organizations that are part of the collaborative today. 
Again, we're all working towards the aim of achieving 70% credit grant participation by 2022, and that is among those that are eligible. Our, our collaborative convenes on a quarterly basis to exchange information and resources. Um, we all share what is available and opportunities to optimize the impact of our efforts. And we work collectively from an action plan of objectives. I'll speak to those five objectives in a moment, um, where progress is shared on those quarterly meetings and we also send timely updates when new resources and materials are available through email. Um, if you care to join the Million Hearts Credit Grant Collaborative, it is an open forum, and the email address is listed here on the slide. So these are the five obje objectives of the collaborative, um, setting the timeline from 2018 to 2021, increasing awareness of the value of credit grab, increasing use of best practices. This is where the credit grab change package comes into play building equity in credit rehab referral participation and program staffing, and increasing sustainability, affordability, and accessibility through innovation. Um, this is where the home-based credit rehab work comes into play. And then finally, measuring, monitoring, and reporting our progress to ensure we're meeting that aim of the 70% target. So for the first objective, we have a number of communication efforts underway. Uh, we have a communications toolkit that is currently available on the Million Hearts website. This is very basic messaging about the value of credit rehab. Um, this is for consumers largely. However, there's some material specifically for physicians and other stakeholders in the credit rehab arena. I um, encourage everyone to explore the, the infographics and fact sheets. Um, there's also a very prominent social media impact. We have credit rehab chats on Twitter. Uh, we also have a hashtag that we're using to spread the word on credit rehab safe lives. Um, and then web content as well. The Million Hearts website has a credit grab webpage that's available for syndication. Um, so it's, anyone can use the code needed to put it in their website. And as we update the Million Hearts website, it gets automatically updated in others. Um, as well as just spreading the word more broadly of the services and benefits you provide in your community. So we have a video of YouTube videos of hospitals and health systems that have showcased the success stories from their patients. It's been a great opportunity to spread the word. Um, again, the Million Hearts CRC at cbc.gov is a web uh, email address to be linked to some of these materials. And we also are curious to know what resources you use and what are available um, in your environment. To increase use of best practices, this came from the original roadmap that I mentioned earlier, is the Million Hearts and AACVPR Credit Rehab Change Package. This is a quality improvement tool that was adapted using the Institute for Healthcare Improvement PDSA approach. We have it available on the website, and I'll go through a little bit of it, more of its details and how it can be used. First, I want to acknowledge the credit rehab contributors, and you see those start with the, the Red Star colleagues from Emory Healthcare, and um, we'll have Demario speak to in a moment, but we want to acknowledge all those that contributed towards the development of the change package um, overall, the 100 plus tools in the, in the quality improvement change package as a whole came for 22 institutions across 18 states, and we're very pleased to have it available on our website, and um, we'll be continuously modifying it to ensure it's meeting the needs of the community. So if you're not familiar with the change package, it is developed of a change concept, which is a general notion of change, um, specific actionable change ideas that can be used to implement and to that's well, I'll mention in a moment, but it extends beyond the referral to participation, adherence, and completion as well. Um, and then finally, we offer tools and resources that are tied to implementing those change ideas. Um, these tools and resources include the AACPR strategies from their value-based website, uh, specific case studies, program-specific tools like electronic health record screenshots and health system dashboards, um, and then organizing organization-specific tools um, from those and our colleagues of the American Hospital Association, the American College of Cardiology, and others. So the, the change package as a whole is broken down into four focus areas. We have systems change. This is really establishing cardiac rehab as a priority in the institution, um, referral, enrollment and participation, and then finally adherence um, to completion. Breaking down a little further, we see the change concepts by the focus areas. So within systems change, we focus on making credit rehab a health system priority. Um, for referrals, it's incorporating referral into the standardized uh, protocol for eligible patients, standardizing that referral process with a, a workflow that makes sense within the, the health system, and then using data to drive improvement in referrals. 
And for demonstration purposes, we'll select that last one, use data to improve in referrals for cardiac rehab. So working from that change concept, we see that we have six change ideas. These are, again, the actionable steps that can be taken. And for each change idea, we have a number of different resources. This is an example of the tools and resources we offer to implement a cardiac rehab registry to identify, track, and manage patients who are referred to a program. I won't go through all of the different change ideas, but moving on to the change concept of enrollment and participation, we see um, I'm sorry, the focus area of enrollment participation, you see a number of change concepts. Um, these are things like engaging a cardiac rehab liaison, um, reduced cost sharing barriers, improving the efficiency in enrollment, developing more flexible models, um, sometimes that's an accelerated program, modifying some basic uh, procedures based on clinical need, and then having a clinical follow-up so that that information gets back to the referring clinician. Um, and then finally with adherence, we focus on improving patients at risk for low engagement, and improving patient engagement largely. These are some of the success stories. We have uh, 16 success stories from across the country. Uh, there's many more to be added to this. I'm happy to share that there's health systems across the country now that are working towards increasing use of cardiac rehab, um, but we're thrilled to be showcasing some of these success stories. And we encourage you to send us your success story. If you've had success in increasing cardiac rehab participation or referral or adherence, um, you can go to the American Hospital Association Huddle for Care website to submit your story. It's an easy way to get that information um, up and on the website and for other hospitals nationwide to use in their transition to care success. Um, we also will be looking to those stories to again add to our change package in the future. Um, finally, the change package is being implemented and disseminated in collaboration with many of our partners. This includes the AACPR state affiliates. Uh, state and local health departments from CDC here at CDC, um, and our colleagues in the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. Also, local YMCAs can be key partners, and currently we're working with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality on a, the Take Heart project. So I'll mention just the Take Heart project right now. It's currently open for receiving applications. Um, it is focused on improving the patient-centered outcomes research, or PCOR, to increase referral, enrollment, and retention in cardiac rehab through automatic referral with liaison. It is a 12-month virtual training, so it will include tech support, coaching, virtual training, and access to cardiac rehab subject matter experts. And again, the focus is on automating the referral process and using trained patient care coordinators to facilitate enrollment. I have the website listed here to apply for the initiative. Um, it is free to apply, and it's an opportunity to get that quality improvement um, support needed to optimize use of cardiac rehab. Uh, the application deadline is October 15th of 2019. And this work ties well within our objectives of building equity in cardiac rehab participation nationwide. Uh, fourth objective of our collaborative is to increase sustainability and affordability and accessibility of cardiac rehab delivery. Um, I mentioned the home-based critic rehab work fits well within this component. Um, that includes the scientific statement that was recently released by the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. Um, AACPR recently released a cardiac rehab summary for payers. Um, here at Million Hearts, we've released an outpatient cardiac rehab use surveillance methodology. This is a document that can be easily lifted and applied towards your claims-based data to assess cardiac rehab participation um, and other key indicators of quality improvement in cardiac rehab. Um, finally, the CMS BPCI advanced model uh, has the opportunity to incorporate measures here in this work for cardiac rehab referral. Finally, the final objective of measure monitoring report, um, we are currently monitoring the Medicare fee-for-service beneficiary access to use of participation, excuse me, um, estimated about 24% of Medicare beneficiaries participate in cardiac rehab. Uh, we have the target again of 70%, so a lot more work to be done. 24% um, have initiated within 21 days and roughly 27% have completed the cardiac rehab. So again, much more room for improvement. Um, we also speak to the ACC AHA clinical performance quality measures for cardiac rehab that are available and the outpatient methodology that I mentioned previously. So again, this is the summary of our objectives of the Cardiac Rehab Collaborative, and we welcome your engagement and participation. Um, specifically, the opportunities for engagement are to register for the HRQ Take Heart Project, 
Um, apply the methodology to your claims database to assess your participation. Submit a quality improvement success story with the American Hospital Association Title for Care platform. Um, spread the word of the value of credit grab using our communication materials. And then if you want to be joining the collaborative as a whole, we welcome your engagement. Um, send us an email at millionheartscrcdc.gov. I believe that concludes my portion of the presentation, and I'll pass it on to Demario. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Uh, my specific focus today is going to be on best practices in optimizing cardiac rehab referrals, enrollment, participation, and adherence. Um, I really want to focus on electronic referral usage uh, because it's by far the most efficient as compared to paper referrals. Um, and we're talking about cardiac rehab referrals here. Many patients report cardiac rehab initiation delays due to the processing of their cardiac rehab referral. And many of those patients wait until post-event follow-ups with their cardiologist to get a referral, um, at which point the patient becomes less motivated, frustrated uh, with the referral process. Uh, so therefore, electronic referrals are by far one of the best examples of how to enroll a patient more efficiently and at a better rate. Uh, let's take a look at a multi-hospital organization that initiated the use of electronic cardiac rehab referrals over a three-year period. If you see in year one, 2016 to 2017, approximately 1,792 eligible MI and PCI cardiac rehab patients were referred. Out of that number, 50% of those were referred electronically. Uh, we're looking at hospital M, U, J, and C. So this is a, a, a multi-hospital organization that has multiple uh, hospitals within that environment. Uh, that was year one, initiation year. Year two, uh, 2017 to 2018, approximately 70.6% of eligible MI and PCI cardiac rehab patients were referred uh, out of the 1,872 eligible patients. So you see an increase there in electronic uh, cardiac rehab referral. In year three, uh, 2018 to 2019, this is March, by the way, March 2018, March 2019, 70.5% of eligible MI slash PCI cardiac rehab patients were referred. So the number is starting to uh, plateau in year three but there is an increase of about 20% usage in cardiac rehab electronic referrals from year one to year three. Uh, so if you see that the data here is just talking a little bit about the results, uh, and that's just two diagnoses, by the way. Um, if we move on to enrollment, uh, enrollment in cardiac rehab is proven to be underutilized due to the various barriers, and Haley mentioned this uh, to some degree, such as physician referrals and availability of cardiac rehab programs in rural settings, uh, demographics. Implementation of AACVPR risk stratification addresses required sessions, time restraints, and logistics barriers that could improve enrollment in cardiac rehab settings. Uh, also, documented patient follow-up and communication post-referral helps to track cardiac rehab enrollment. Um, Promoting marketing, educational courses, and consultations, and this is a thing that we do at Emory Healthcare, at the time of scheduling cardiac rehab appointments, such as availability, improves enrollment. Uh, you want to give patients an idea of time frames in which they can come, uh, 6.30, 7.30, 9 o'clock, 10.30, 1.30, 3.15, 4.30, are examples of uh, cardiac rehab appointment times in which a patient can participate, therefore addressing work-related needs of those patients who are still uh, in the workforce, and also needs of patients who may have retired. Uh, also, there are educational courses, a uh, plethora of educational courses offered, which includes risk factor modification or lifestyle change courses, exercise safety uh, classes, free orthopedic uh, lecture series, and nutritional consultations. Uh, if we move on into participation and adherence, uh, individual treatment plans are the gold standard among AACPR practical guidelines because they address individual concerns. Uh, delayed post-event enrollment decreases patients' motivation and their ability to participate in cardiac rehab. Um, also, delayed entry, and I'll give you one example, 
a delayed entry patient once cited, I'm back to exercising at my local gym, therefore there's no need for cardiac rehab. Uh, as we move on with patient adherence, utilization of individual custom exercise prescriptions not only meet the needs of patients by addressing their concerns, which may include cognitive impairment, orthopedic limitations, advanced stage, physical limitations such as hearing loss, vision uh, loss, thereby improving motivation and participation adherence. Uh, risk factor education courses that address availability concerns and different learning styles have also proven to be effective. Examples include face-to-face -face educational courses, phone teleconferences for nutritional consultations, and electronic mediums such as PowerPoint um, uh, are, have all been proven to increase participation and adherence here within Emory Healthcare. I want to give an example of an individual's exercise prescription plan, which has been shown to increase participation uh, amongst patients and improve patient satisfaction surveys. So if we take a look at this exercise prescription, this is one that's created for a high MET level avid exerciser, ultra marathon or adult athlete. Um, it's customizable. You can see that it has different choices for aerobic leg exercises as well as aerobic arm exercises, alternating between the two, uh, and which includes warm-ups, resistance training, and stretching. Uh, this one would definitely be for someone that has a MET level of at least seven or above. If you take a look at the, uh, the next exercise prescription plan, it's designed for a lower MET level patient that typically may have orthopedic challenges such as hip replacements, knee replacements, vertigo, balance issues. This particular patient is probably going to be a fall risk, uh, may have some cognitive challenges. Uh, it's a more simplified version of the advanced exercise prescription that you saw earlier. And it's designed to meet not only the low-level patient needs, but also uh, the needs of patients who would have orthopedic limitations and have a difficult time transitioning from one piece of equipment to the next. Again, we, we're trying to improve adherence and participation in cardiac rehab. So have a couple of references here uh, from the American uh, ADCDPR and uh, some of the information in enrollments and electronic referrals that I have here. But I wanted to, again, uh, thank Haley and Tim for the opportunity for presenting some of the best practices that are used within Emory Healthcare as well um, as the studies that I sh showed earlier with the electronic referral. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Haley and uh, Damaro. Uh, right now, what, what we want to do is open up uh, for questions. So if you have a question, please feel free to uh, type in one of your questions, and then I'll have the uh, presenters address them. So Haley, uh, if you can open up the question tab, we do have a question from Lori. Opening it up now. Having a hard time opening up, here we go. I uh, see the question, many of the issues with referral can only be realized on a healthcare system level. Is there anything we clinicians can do on a day-to-day -day basis to help with this process? Um, yeah, so there is a, um, one of the tools in the change package is speaks to how you can use the registry data uh, to monitor referral. And a few of those registries are now breaking up their, their data by the clinician. So there should be um, an opportunity for a feedback loop for a clinician to know the referral rate. Um, and some practices are even going to the extent of figuring out the success of those referrals. So we know with a lot of the referral processes, it's a matter of checking a box in an order set. Um, but as spoken to earlier and from uh, DeMario's presentation, it really is uh, a key component of having that eye-to-eye -eye conversation and with the Take Heart initiative that AHRQ is leading, having a facilitator, a cardiac rehab liaison or care coordinator, if you will, um, meet the patient in the hospital and have those discussions at the bedside to really facilitate that process. Um, but having a referral um, 
data gathered by the health system and having those data shared with the cl referring clinician um, can be a way to help increase the referral rate. There's also a component um, for participation adherence to send back rep reports on the progress of the patient back to the referring clinician. Um, and we've, we've heard an example, I think it's from Christiana Care in our change package, um, that that's been an effective approach for having more clinicians um, successfully referring their patients. I want to piggyback off of Haley here on this one. Um, another thing that you can do, having a physician champion is is vital to uh, addressing referral issues. Uh, you know, most cardiac rehabs have, and all cardiac rehabs have a, a medical director that's typically a cardiologist. Uh, in that case, uh, they can act as a physician champion to the referring physicians uh, to address some of the concerns that the referring attendees may have with getting the referral initiated, uh, selecting the appropriate uh, referral, uh, you know, referrals for the particular patient, time frames on in which that patient should start the program. Uh, that can be handled on a physician to physician level uh, just by identifying a physician champion within a hospital healthcare system. I'll add that the American College of Cardiology currently has a um, training module, um, it's accessible, free, and online. It's there's a link to it on the Million Hearts Cardiac Rehab webpage that can provide more information about the value of cardiac rehab more broadly and the specific role of cardiologists and other referring clinicians in facilitating cardiac rehab participation. All right, without any other questions that I see, I'd like to uh, thank everyone uh, for sharing their afternoon with us. Uh, I, again, I will be uh, sending out the uh, continuing education uh, unit uh, and the links to this video recording. Uh, after everything is processed, please give us a day or two. But thank you again and hope you will join us uh, in next month's webinar. Take care, everyone.